Well, I had something in mind to begin the show with tonight, but this past week I was inspired to write an article entitled, Is War Necessary? And I have decided to go over that article with you tonight in this first segment, and then I'd like your comments. I'd like to know what you think about this and where you think there may be a flaw in my reasoning. I happen to be 70 years old. I find that very hard to believe because too often I feel like I'm 16, not because of my physical condition, but perhaps because of my immaturity. But be that as it may, the fact remains that I am 70 years old, and I've been on this earth for 70 years. The interesting thing about that is that in those 70 years, I have never hit another human being. I have been attacked a few times in my life. I've been threatened with a fight a few times in my life. Probably people wanted to fight me, I would say, somewhere between 12 and 15 times in my life. About three or four times, it did degenerate into a fight. The other times, I was able to talk my way out of it. In the times it did degenerate into a fight, I got struck, but I was never hurt substantially, never got a black eye, never felt any strong damages at all, and I never hit back at anybody. And in all of this, I have never been humiliated, I have never lost any prestige, and I have never become a target for other bullies just simply because I refused to fight back. Now, I understand that I have been fortunate. I grew up in a very nice suburban area of Los Angeles, which was a much nicer area then than it is today. And I realized that if I had been born, uh, if I'd had the bad fortune to be born in an inner city area where there are gangs or something else, I might not have been able to avoid violence so easily. But that's a very important point. Being fortunate in the circumstances of my birth and where I grew up, I didn't squander that good fortune by looking for trouble. Now, America was also fortunate in the circumstances of its birth. It fought a revolution to extract itself from British rule, and we assumed that that was a necessary fight. But once it had done that, it, had, it now found itself in the best neighborhood possible. America is bounded by two friendly nations and two enormous oceans. There's no need to look for trouble here, obviously. And yet, ruled by American politicians instead of British politicians, the United States has been embroiled in one street fight after another. In fact, if you look through the 20th century, and I'm going to do this year by year in my book, The War Racket, which I'm working on and I expect to be finished with any millennium now, if you look at the 20th century year by year, you find that there were less than 20 years in an entire century when America was at peace with the world. There were world wars that the United States had to stick its nose into, the Cold War, police actions, the gunboat diplomacy in Latin America in the early century and then again in the 20s and then again in the 50s and 60s, overthrowing governments in Iran and Guatemala and Greece and other places, suppressing the Philippine rebe uh, rebellion at the beginning of the century, interfering with the Mexican Revolution in 1913, firing missiles at Afghanistan and the Sudan, invading Iraq, invading Panama, invading Grenada, bombing Libya, on and on and on it goes. Americans have lived with the tension of conflict and violence almost their entire lives. And we live in a good neighborhood. It makes no sense whatsoever. Now, contrast our circumstances with those of Switzerland. The poor Swiss had the misfortune of being born in one of the worst neighborhoods in the world. Now, we don't think of Europe as an area of turmoil today because for the last 40 years or so, it has been rel relatively quiet there. But look over the past couple of centuries and more, and what you find are the Napoleonic Wars, the Spanish Armada, the British Empire, the Franco-Prussian War, the World Wars, which both started in Europe. All of these conflicts, just constant conflicts, ethnic rivalries, uh, grudge matches, uh, arming to the teeth. Oh, I mean, governments ready to go to war at the drop of a hat. Populations nursing grudges against each other. And all these elements have kept Europe in turmoil for centuries. You know, Switzerland is like an inner city family that every night hears gunfire outside its windows. And yet, and yet, Switzerland hasn't been involved in a war in the past two centuries. Not one single war. They managed to be to avoid being sucked into the world wars. They did not get involved in the Cold War, and they had not been involved in any of the other conflicts that have beset Europe over the last couple of centuries. The Swiss have not been fortunate in their geographical circumstances, but they've dealt with those circumstances intelligently. It wasn't by the grace of dictators that they've avoided war. It has been a national policy to do so, to make absolutely sure that they don't get into war. They've always made sure it was in the self-interest of warring nations to leave Switzerland out of their quarrels. They've devised ingenious defenses to demonstrate to other countries that while it's possible to conquer Switzerland, they can make it intolerable for the conquest for the conqueror. In other words, yes, you could take over this country, but it would cost you plenty. 
and sometime we might go into some of the things that they did to make that possible. But perhaps more than anything else, they have made themselves an indispensable trading partner to any country that otherwise might see some profit in invading Switzerland. When I wrote my article this past week, somebody wrote and said, well, you have to realize that Switzerland has done this by financing both sides of the war. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just not true. Switzerland's banks are privately owned, and private-owned banks do not throw money at both sides in a war. Only governments do that, because private-owned bank, privately owned banks cannot make money uh, lending money to both sides of the war, because one of those sides is going to lose and not pay back the loans. Well, my point in all of this is that it may seem that war is inevitable for many countries, and there are places, the Balkans, where they have these ethnic rivalries going back centuries. There are places in Asia and Africa where you have the same kind of things. You have the problems between India and Pakistan. And, of course, by sticking Israel in the middle of the Arab countries of the Middle East, carving out land for them, you guaranteed that there was going to be conflict there. But Switzerland has proven that it isn't inevitable for anyone, not even for a country as poorly situated as Switzerland, to be involved in war. So why, then, is America continually at war over one thing or another? Whenever the U.S. goes to war somewhere, the politicians tell us that they tried diplomacy and, unfortunately, diplomacy failed, and that war was the very, 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 very last resort. But the truth is always that the politicians did not try much at all to avoid war. And the diplomacy was bound to fail because it wasn't diplomacy at all, it was demands. It involved our politicians making demands on a foreign country, demands we, first of all, have no authority, no moral authority to make, and secondly, demands that were known in advance to be unacceptable to the foreigners and so that war was inevitable. In the few cases that America has been attacked, it's because our politicians were trying to dictate to other countries, countries that represented no threat to America at all. In the one type of case, the foreigners attacked because they realized that war was inevitable with the United States because of the browbeating from the U.S., and they figured they'd better attack first in order to gain an advantage and try to delay the inevitable. That was the case with the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. Not that the Japanese were right in what they were doing, but they would never have attacked Pearl Harbor if Roosevelt hadn't been browbeating them. And the second type of instance is where attacking seemed to be the only way to strike back in America, which was throwing its weight around in other people's business. And that's what we saw with 9-11. How easy it would have been for Americans to have lived the past two centuries in peace. We have never been attacked by a country that hasn't first been subject to interference by our politicians. Now, maybe there are other people in the world who aren't so fortunately situated geographically as we are, but we are situated that way. We'll continue this in a minute. Harry Brown, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. Once again, the phone number is 1-800-510-TALK or 1-800-510-8255, or you can email me, question at harrybrown.org. Continuing on the same vein as war necessary, I don't believe that anyone can seriously believe that terrorists have struck America because they hate our freedom, uh, our democracy, or our prosperity. If that were true, they would have warmed up first by attacking Switzerland, a much easier target, which is just as free, just as prosperous, and just as democratic as the United States. Also, if you stop and think about it, terrorists don't kill themselves anonymously and in quiet. They do it to make a point. And when they do, they let you know exactly why they have done it. I have not heard one word of complaint from Osama bin Laden or anybody in al-Qaeda or anyone taking credit for any kind of the terrorist attacks that have taken place against the United States in which there has been a single complaint about our freedom, our democracy, or our prosperity. But there have been complaints about our support for Israel, about our dropping of the atomic bomb on Japan, about our having troops at Mecca in Saudi Arabia, and about our meddling with countries around the world. We have not been attacked by terrorists because of our way of life. We have been attacked because of our government's policies. All right, so what would you do about terrorism? Well, first of all, change our foreign policy, and we would not have had a 9-11 to begin, with, to begin with. But all right, Mr. Wise Guy, that's all well and good. But now that it has happened, now that Pandora's box has been opened and all the evils of the world have gotten out, what would you do differently from what George Bush is doing? Well, I hope you won't be intimidated by such a question, because there's really a very simple answer for it. It's just simply this. I'm not certain what I would do. But I know one thing for sure. With $2 trillion at my disposal, I could hire the best minds in the world to find a solution that didn't involve using the caveman tactics of running around the world beating people to death. But, of course, no one in power really is interested in finding alternatives to war. They arm to the teeth, and then they tell us that we will obtain peace through strength. What a wonderful slogan, peace through strength. It's almost Orwellian. Well, America has been overwhelmingly strong for a century now. And we're still waiting to see the peace. How long is it going to take before that strength gives us peace? As Charles Beard put it, 
We've had perpetual war for perpetual peace. Every single war we've gotten into was going to change everything for good. It was going to outlaw war. It was going to make the world safe for democracy. It was going to create a United Nations that would stop any struggle before it escalated to the point that it could harm a lot of people. Well, I think one of the biggest problems that we have in America with regard to this country's foreign policy and its military is that we have an overwhelming national offense. We can beat to death any country in the world. We can blow any country to smithereens, but we have practically no national defense. And it gives the politicians the justification to run around the world and use that overwhelming national offense to beat up people, saying we have to get them before they get us first. We wouldn't have to do that if we had any kind of a defense in this country at all. Well, to come back to where we started, I have never hit anyone in 70 years of life. And as I said before, not doing so has never caused me any humiliation, nor has it made me the target of bullies who would then pick on me because I didn't resist. If America had made peace the object as well, it could be neither humiliated nor picked upon. So to answer the question, is war necessary? For Americans, no, it is not necessary. Is war inevitable? For Americans, unfortunately, yes. So long as we give politicians the power to meddle in our lives and in the lives of foreigners, we are going to have to live with war. And that probably means for the rest of our lives. I hope not. Well, let's go to Paradise Valley, Arizona, then, and talk with Mike. Good evening, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, let's... this is the first time I've heard your show. I'd like to thank you for bringing up Switzerland as an example that peace is possible. Um, my comment is that uh, the alternative to peace is, a, is ultimately a police state. Um, as we run around the world interfering in the affairs of other countries and garrisoning our, our troops in 144 different countries, why uh, we make a lot of enemies. And it's simply uh, logically and physically possible for uh, substantial terrorist acts to occur. And the only way to really stop that is to create the Soviet-style police state where people have to register and get permission to drive from one town uh, to another town. And that's really uh, part of the structure that I think is being uh, created the, the the structure and the organization for that type of a police state to be implemented. So uh, if we, I think as a motivation to pursue peace, we could consider the alternative, the police state. Yes, that's a very good point. And, and if I may interrupt for a second, uh, you're pointing out that these things build up one, one after another. One thing leads to another. And it's not necessary to believe that there is any kind of design or conspiracy behind this. All you have to do is to put in place the mechanism for taking away people's civil liberties. And first this official, then that official, then this Congress, then that legislature will find reasons to use that to expand upon it, uh, to make it more and more uh, tight around the citizens till you finally get to the point where, as you say, you have to get a permit to drive to the next town, something that would seem just uh, incomprehensible today, but yet two years from now or four years from now will seem like the logical step necessary to stop terrorists from wreaking havoc on the United States. Yes, and I would agree that uh, that you don't have to presume a conspiracy, and I would happen to think logically there is probably not a pervasive conspiracy, but there is a human principle that operates here, which I call the Solomon Principle, or the man, and not woman's, but man's intent, man's uh, irresistible impulse to aggregate power. Uh, Solomon aggregated uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines, which was kind of irrational, nonsensical. Yes, uh, I, I'd have to say that nobody needs 355 wives. We ought to have a law against that. Yeah, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that you put people in power uh, in, in the head of governments, and they tend to aggregate more and more power and find more uh, apparently rational reasons for doing this. I've always uh, said that the best day in Bill Clinton's presidency was the day when the Murrah building in Oklahoma City was attacked, and he could rally the country behind him, just like George Bush, uh, the best day in his presidency was 911, where he immediately got everyone rallied behind him. It's just right. You mean the best day for them? For, for those two individuals, right. in, in terms of consolidating their power. Definitely. And so that's a human trait we have to guard against. Um, and absolutely. Mike, you're absolutely right. I agree with everything you've said, and I appreciate your comments. Uh, I hope you continue to listen to the broadcast, and I hope you continue to avail us of your ideas from time to time. Well, thank you. You're very articulate. I've, I've, I've just, is your last name spelled B-R-O-W-N-E? That's right. I think I've seen your name on the Internet or in writing before. Well, you can go to my website, harrybrown.org, and there are literally hundreds of articles there that I've written, all from a libertarian standpoint. And you may have run across me as the Libertarian Party's candidate for president in 1996 and 2000. I have some Libertarian friends, and that's where I must have run across it. Well, thank you very much for your show. Thank you. Let's go now to Metairie, Louisiana, and talk with Don. Don, are you with us this evening? Yeah, how are you doing? Just fine. What's up? Well, uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, first of all, uh, I was going to mention about uh, Bush's uh, nomination for the uh, Judge uh, Pickering. Mm -hmm. I was uh, happy to see that, although I do think uh, it's going to take you know Congress, of course, to approve that or what have you. Um, I, you know what? Listening to you for the last half hour, I think uh, I understand why you all are very much of a minority in this country, 
uh, I think it's pretty ill, the, the way you think, that we, we, we stuck our nose in different things. And thank God we stuck our nose in, in Europe and, uh, uh, you know, in Normandy and, uh, you know, in, in fighting the Japanese. And uh, thank God we did that. Are really? you aware of that? Do you read the papers, sir? Well, I lived through it. You did? Yes. You're I was 70 years old. Yes. Yeah, you yeah. lived through it. We were wrong. Well, how were we wrong during World War II? Well, first of all, the Japanese would never have attacked Pearl Harbor if Roosevelt hadn't been browbeating the Japanese to give up their conquests in East Asia. Now, I do not agree with the idea of the Japanese taking over colonies in East Asia, but then I didn't agree with the British or the Dutch or the Chinese or the Germans having colonies in East Asia either, but Roosevelt didn't do anything about those. He was browbeating the Japanese, and he was doing it for a specific purpose, hoping somehow to get somebody to attack the United States so that he could overcome the isolationist uh, viewpoint that prevailed in the United States in 1940 and 1941. People were so fed up with what happened in World War I with the United States getting involved in a mess that had nothing to do with the United States and creating havoc by the United States entry into World War I, creating communism in the Soviet Union, creating Hitler in Germany, that they didn't want any part of it. And Roosevelt knew the only possible way America could get into the European war was if somebody attacked the United States, and he got his way. And I'm not telling you something that I have made up or that I just have a conspiratorial mind for. This is from the words of Henry Stimson, his Secretary of War, uh, Knox uh, and uh, Cordell Hull, his Secretary of State, Francis Perkins, his Secretary of Labor, all these people wrote their memoirs. All these people kept diaries. And all of this stuff has been published. It just is of no interest to the American people. Once the war in Japan and, and Europe was over in 1945, people just wanted to get back to their own lives, and any investigation of all of this really had no legs whatsoever. But because America got into World War I, we had a World War II. Then America gets into World War II, builds up the Soviet Union, and so guess what? Now we have to fight the Cold War for 45 years. And during the Cold War, the United States goes in, overthrows the government, democratically elected government in Iran, a democratically elected government government in Guatemala, it interferes in Greece, it interferes in Vietnam, it interferes in the Middle East, it interferes all over the world, sometimes with justifying this uh, by uh, being a, a way of fighting communism, sometimes having nothing to do with communism whatsoever, and in every one of those countries, as little as Americans know about these interventions, in every one of those countries, there are thousands or millions of people who do know that the United States intervened and that they hate the United States for doing this. There are people all over the world who hate and fear the United States, and most hate, Americans don't even know about it. I think you hate the United States, too. No. I do not. I love this country. I love what I love what it was supposed to be, a country of small government, a country of constitutionally limited government, a country in which there was no income tax, a country in which people were free to pursue their own pursuits without politicians like Teddy Kennedy, George Bush, Bill Clinton, and Trent Lott making all their most intimate decisions for them, forcing them into a bankrupt uh, retirement scheme called Social Security. Okay, but are, are we free in this country to do as we please, to do to, to, to invent something and create uh, Yeah, something okay, and... why don't you drop out of Social Security and find a better retirement system? Are well, you free to do that? That's not the point of making if I invented something tomorrow, I could become a millionaire. Maybe. Maybe there's, maybe somebody would pass a law saying that that particular product can't be marketed. There are plenty of such laws. Oh, there are that? lots of laws in this country that, that uh, prevent things from being marketed. There are, try, to, try to start a, a taxi cab business in Denver or New York or practically any city in the country and see what happens to you. Well, okay, well, that's one example, taxi cab. Okay, well, uh, there, I, I can give you all kinds of examples. Well, all right, but uh, what about, uh, you know, a, a, a Bill Gates inventing something that, you know, it's revolutionary. Well, we are not living in a total police state, and I thank God for that. But the fact of the matter is that we are not nearly as free as we should be, and we are not nearly as at peace as we should be. And the whole point of what I talked about in the first half hour was that America could be at peace, but instead we are living in fear, fear that we are going to be attacked by terrorists, fear that somebody is going to smuggle some biological or chemical weapons in the United States, fear that somebody is going to smuggle a nuclear bomb into the United States. And that's awful. Of course it is. Why aren't they trying? Why aren't they afraid in this way in Switzerland or even in Belgium or France or Germany? Why is it only the United States that is the target of all of this? Well, so we're not. I mean, come on, they've attacked Paris, they've attacked uh, different countries in, in Europe. Uh, it's usually the American embassy that they're attacking. But usually, no, no. Come on. I mean, not even. Well, we know why they hate us because we, we support Israel. Well, that's part of it. There's no question about that. That's and why, why is America supporting Israel? Why, why, is America, why is America giving any of your money to any foreign government anywhere in the world? There is nothing in the Constitution that authorizes our government to tax American citizens for the purpose of propping up a foreign government. Well, okay, I, I'll buy that. But, I mean, as far as the terrorism goes, it, it's not just, they don't just attack American uh, interests. I mean, they attack, they just kill innocent people anywhere because they're, they're evil. Evil. So yeah. that, what, is, what does evil mean? Oh, come on. Well, I, I really want to know. I mean, what, what, separates somebody, what separates somebody who's acting in what he perceives to be his own self-interest from somebody who is just pure evil? What's the difference between, between the two? The United States is acting in its self-interest, supposedly by going over and killing people in Iraq. What, what, why oh, isn't that easy? killing innocent people in Iraq. Uh, I mean, come on, man. You're crazy. I mean, you, you, don't believe any civili you don't believe any innocent civilians have died in well, Iraq? Sure they did. Every, look, you have that war. You do have that war. I'm not condoning it, but, I mean, that's, 
that's war. Right. So as okay, long as so as long as you don't have to go, it's all right that innocent people well, don't. don't have it. Where? Well, I, I I suspect that you haven't. Right. Have you, you been over there? I have not. You mean Iraq or, or yes, in Iraq. As long as you don't have to be over there being one of those being killed, then it's always easy to slough off the idea well, that well, somebody's life has been snuffed out. Well, have you heard the military people over there? They're not exactly. Uh, I'm, nobody wants to go to war. Okay, nobody, but they but they do it over and over and over again. Sorry, nobody wants to die. Yeah, the military people though they're they're behind our president, and they're, they're glad to be in the military. They joined voluntarily. Okay, but what about the people that they're killing on behalf of our president? Those are killing. What, what are you saying? We're slaughtering innocent people? There are a lot of uh, over ten thousand Iraqi civilians have died. Yeah. Well, Don, of course. Don, I thank you for your call. Okay. We're going to have to take a break now. Uh, feel free to call anytime. Complain. Do anything that you want. We're glad to hear from you. This is Harry Brown. When we come back, we'll continue uh, getting ideas from around the country. You can join us, 1-800-510-TALK. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hello again. Harry Brown here. Let's talk instead uh, with Dan in San Diego, California. Dan, good evening. Nice to hear from you. Good evening, Harry. It's, you are, uh, I just I so much love listening to you. you. You have the depth of history that most people don't know. And one time, in fact, I heard you say you had read 200 books while you were in the service. Oh, yes. Well, I was stationed on a desert island. Uh, in fact, I'll have to tell that story sometime. I was stationed at NOE Talk where they had the H-bomb test, so I know a little something about weapons of mass destruction. I was actually a cryptographer enciphering the secret messages about the H-bomb tests that were going on there, but most of the time during the year that I was there, there was nothing to do, not on the eight hours in the crypto center, not in the 16 hours that I wasn't on duty, and so I just kept reading books, and uh, very often I would read a book a day, and it was a wonderful time to get an education because I'd never gone to college, so this was my opportunity to read up on just about everything. Well, it's fantastic listening to you. You really ought to have your own show on the History Channel. Um, I, I called about something you said earlier when you encouraged people to talk about the war and say, you know, I, I don't know exactly what I would do if I were the president, but, and you went on to some things there. And I would like to encourage people to a few suggestions I have exactly what I would do if I were the president. Fire away. They're, they're under three categories. One is disabling terror. The next is defunding terror. And finally, deflating terror. Uh, in the category of disabling terror, uh, we talk about the truth of security on airlines being the fact that, uh, that on 9-11 and up to 9-11 and since 9-11, we really don't have the right to choose the type of armed security we want. So offering, a, uh, allowing a free market in airline security would have meant that uh, box cutters could not take down an airplane. So by allowing armed security, we disable terror. Yes, and, and, and as we've discussed before, different airlines can offer different levels of safety and security, and you can decide for yourself whether you want to go the cheap route or whether you want to go the secure route or whatever it is. That's, that's what we should do if we really are free individuals. And I believe that it's also something the Second Amendment would provide for us today if there was any respect for that law. Sure. Uh, in the category now of defunding terror, uh, find a way to allow oil production in the U.S., which would pull some of the money out of the Middle East. Simple as that. Um, the right wing, they they like this, but the left wing hates it, so we lose. Now, then, in the other, also in the category of defunding terror, uh, that's allowing people to buy drugs the boring way they buy alcohol today. Um, the left wing likes this a little bit, but in practice, of course, we lose on both finding a way to allow oil production in the U.S. and allowing people to buy drugs the boring way they buy alcohol, all right. of which would defund terror. So. That's right, because the, because the ones that uh, disagree with us on each of those uh, disagree vehemently, and those who agree with us do not agree very strongly or do anything about it. Also, um, uh, Dan, we're going to have to break for the news, so I hope you'll stay on the line and sure. give us your third part of this, because uh, you're making a lot of sense. We're going to break now for the news, folks, but uh, after we hear all the depressing news of what's going on around the world, let's talk about some more uplifting things in the second hour and what we can do to make life better. This is Harry Brown. Stay with us and join us, if you like, by calling 1-800-510-TALK. We'll be back shortly. Well, hello again. This is Harry Brown, and we still have almost another hour to go, and I would be glad to hear from you to see what your thoughts are tonight. We've been talking about the question, is war necessary? Do we really have to go to war? Did we really have to spend about 80 out of the last 100 years fighting somebody somewhere in the world, or could this country have lived in peace if its leaders, its politicians, had simply minded their own business? Well, we've uh, been talking with various people who have had various ideas, and right now we're getting some good ideas from Dan in San Diego, California. Dan, you're still with us, aren't you? I am. Okay, uh, quick review. You said defunding terrorists, and what was the... What well, the... I said disable terror by allowing free market and airline security, right. but the politicians won't touch that because it needs less government. That was disabling terror. And they won't let us defund terror by finding a way to allow oil protection and production in the U.S. Uh, of course, that would take money out of the Middle East, but it would also reduce government in America. So while well, you and I and libertarians want that, the politicians won't. And I was also talking about defunding terror by allowing people to buy drugs, the boring way to get alcohol. But once again, that's the left government thing, so it's just not on the table. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So now if we could have defunded and disabled terror, like I said, we could deflate terror, too, by bringing our troops home to take a truly defensive stance, another left government angle which costs less, so that's off the table. And um, we would pursue 9-11 culprits with police tactics and rules of American justice, which is certainly more civilized than, you know, that goes in the category of the thing that libertarians do support, but 
Uh, and as you said earlier, ending government giveaways to other countries. So by bringing our troops home, pursuing the 9-11 culprits with civilized tactics, and by ending government giveaways to other countries, we deflate the terrorist argument to recruit other terrorists. Yeah, all good points, Dan. I really appreciate that. Check in with us from time to time. You always have good ideas. Thanks. Let's now talk with Grace in West Tawakoni. Tawakoni. Uh, Tawakoni. Is that? Yes, the... it's Indian. Uh, and where are you? Well, what Texas. State? Oh, Texas. I thought maybe you were in Hawaii or something. No, <laughs> it's called West Tawakoni. Texas had a tribe of Indians called Tawakonis. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I live on a big lake. Um, I am a Desert Storm veteran. I've been there. I played the big game in the sand. I. Basically, we should have done it then, because when I came back from the desert, they took six and a half months out of my life. I had small children, and when I came back, I said, we're going to be back in five to ten years. Where are we? We're right back. I wanted Saddam's head on a silver platter. When I was over there, I saw a lot of reports that never made it back to the United States, what this man was doing. This, you know, it's, uh, what can I say, our government... They play pawns between Iraq and Iran. We funded both of them. We funded all of them. It is time to stop it. It is time that our government starts looking at our own backyard. Stop putting all this money in these foreign guns and stop funding terrorism because we have been doing it for years. I agree with you. I can't argue with you a bit. I don't know that I would. However, I don't know that I would agree about. Well, we should have gotten Saddam Hussein then. Well. I don't that, think that, I don't I don't think you should have had to give up six and a half months of your life and spend it over there. I don't think we had any business interfering in what was a dispute between Kuwait and Iraq, and there isn't one person in a hundred who has the slightest idea why they were even arguing. Well, the reason why I went over there was because a, a lot of our politicians had money tied up in Kuwait, and when they made, when they went into Kuwait, it was to liberate Kuwait because what Saddam did was totally wrong. Uh, I was not in Saudi. I was in a little country called UAE, United Arab Emirates. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of Kuwaitis there. When the war was finally called off, you know, that we won, I cannot begin to tell you how many Kuwaitis came up to me and going, oh, American, thank you, thank you, we can go home now. Sure. Well, that's that's fine. And uh, obviously, if you take sides in a war and you tip the scales one way or another, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to thank you for it. And, of course, there are also going to be a lot of people that are going to hate you for it. And a lot of those people right there now in Iraq, the people who hate us for it, are over there sending uh, rockets and uh, missiles and grenades and uh, rifle fire and so on at American troops. I and understand that, but you got to take consideration. They've got 30 years of brainwashing. And what do we have? Oh. <laughs> Hundreds of years. <laughs> you know, I mean, what gets me is, where's our government going toward? You know, they're, they're taking uh, our true belief from the Bible and God. You cannot do anything. You know, you can't uh, put the Ten Commandments, uh, not the Commandments, but the, uh, it's, it's put the, uh, our article that we actually stand for. You know, yeah. do not. You know what I'm saying. I'm well, sorry. I'm in a bad mood. I understand, and it's but, not it's not that hard to be in a bad mood these days about things. And it's just the way our government is going. I am so worried. I've heard this. It was pounded in my head as a child. Grace, we're heading for socialism. My dad is 86 years old, and he's been saying this ever since I was a teenager. He says our government is taking more and more away from us. Well, I don't. I think I think he's just overwrought. After all, I I realize that the government runs the social security system. I realize that the government uh, runs the power system, the power grid in the country. I realize that the government now spends well over half of all the money that's spent on health care in the country. I realize that the government runs our schools and educates our children. I realize that the government does all these things and has over two trillion dollars of our money. Uh, but socialism? Well, I guess maybe now that slowly, I think about it, if you stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. Uh, it is slowly getting there. The point is, the question is, at what point is it socialism if it isn't there already? Uh, I understand exactly what you're saying, Grace, and I, my attempt at irony failed, so just excuse that. But I really appreciate your call, and I hope you'll stay with us and give oh, us a I call know. from time to Thanks so much for the call, Grace. Let's go now to New Orleans and talk with Linda. Good evening, Linda. I'm Sarah. Hi. What's up tonight? Well, it's like this. Whether you, you ask a question, um, uh, do we need a war? You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, there's no stopping it. Uh, there's nothing the voters can do. There's nothing we can do. Those in power are going to do what they want to do. And when uh, the president went over there uh, to the east, well, he he knows what he's doing. He knew what he's doing. That was the beginning of uh, the next war that's coming. There's no stopping it. And it's just like, now, think about this. <clears throat> he's no different than Roosevelt. Evil as hell. I know Roosevelt is in the deepest part of hell, but what he allowed <laughs> to happen, allowed, knowing that it was coming, knowing that the Japs were going to bomb Pearl Harbor, 
and letting those boys be blown to the kingdom come, knowing what was going to happen, he kept his mouth shut because he wanted to go to war, just like our president now. They all want to go to war. They have no compassion on, on life, no compassion on, on, on our boys. Don't I know. Care. They're, like, they're like chess men who have to be sacrificed. Sacrifice the pawns for the sake of the queen or the king. And that's what the men at Pearl Harbor were. That's the, the men over in they Iraq are. Uh, of course they are. It's an interesting thing if you stop and think about it. You look at all the lists of the greatest presidents in American history, and who are they? They are Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Wilson. Roosevelt got lost for a while. He couldn't find him. He didn't want to talk. He wanted to get, you know, he stayed away for uh, 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 some time, you know. Well, my point, my point is that the presidents who are remembered as the great presidents are the ones who led us in war. And this is a great incentive for George Bush or anybody else to want to make his mark on history by leading us through a war. I can't understand how some people say what a great president he is. I mean, are they blind? Can't they see what he's doing, what he, what he is, what he truly is? I mean, well, obviously he had... Well, Mr. Uh, Brown, tell me this. <laughs> yes. How can our president be a Christian, so-called man of God, and, if he is And a he, nev he never heard of the Sermon on the Mount. Linda, thanks for your call. We'll be right back, folks. Stay with us. Hello again, Harry Brown here, and we've been talking tonight about the question, is war necessary? If you would like to see my article on the subject, just go to my website, harrybrown.org. And you don't even have to put an E on the end of Brown because it's a really smart website. It can figure it out. And on the home page, there are links to several of my recent articles. And the first link you'll see is to the article, Is War Necessary? I might mention also that there is a topical index that you can go to to find articles on just about any subject you might want, having anything to do with politics, government, society, and so forth. And I would be glad to have you look at any of that and make comments on them. Tonight, we've been getting a lot of comments from people, and I've been getting a lot of emails, and I would like to get into some of the emails, but I hate to leave people waiting on the phone, so I'm only going to read one email to you, at least for the moment, from someone named Tom out there in cyberspace, who says, you, sir, are the biggest moron I have ever heard. Sedition, you should be charged and shot. You're the enemy. Oh, you are the, he doesn't use punctuation. You're the enemy within. You're the enemy within, Mike Savage talks about. You know nothing about nothing, friggin' idiot. If we are attacked again, I hope Ground Zero is your friggin' house with all of you in it. Well, all of me goes wherever I go. I don't leave part of me in some other place. But if you're talking about my wife being in it at the same time, well, I'll show a little sympathy. Let's talk to somebody now who knows how to spell. C.A. in Phoenix, Arizona. Good evening, C.A. How are you this evening? I'm fine, sir. And you? I'm just fine. You on a cell phone? Yes, sir. Okay, well, let's let's have it. What's up? All right. You know, um, I would say, judging from what I read, it's all, it seems to have tendency. Um, I get destiny to uh, interfere with other people, you know? Hello? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry you cut out for just a moment there, at least as far as I know. What what was it you were saying about interfering with uh, other people? It seems to almost be this country's destiny to interfere with other people. I and see. I think, I think it started back in the Civil War. When Lincoln won, he won the war, but he expanded the federal um, the federal uh, government. Yes. I don't, I don't know if he had this kind of expansion in mind, but um, it, it seems to have gone on past him. To Woodrow Wilson, who just screwed up our country's money supply, and then we started with World War One, World War Two. If you really read and, and look at the causes of what has happened, it's been because of the interference of big business and big government that have caused all these wars and all this strife and stuff. It's always been intervention. It's always been because of governmental intervention. You have a, you have a perfectly good point there. You well, know what I mean? Yes, I do. The uh, reception we're getting is not too good, so I'm going to terminate the call there and, and just make a couple of comments, but I appreciate your calling and let us know your feelings about it. You mentioned because of big business and big government. I agree with you. When we say big business, we're not talking about all businesses. Microsoft probably isn't pushing for war, uh, but there are many, many, many large companies that do profit from war, and so they make donations to politicians who are pro-war, who are more likely to get us into war. And, of course, Halliburton and its many subsidiaries has done very well with the war. But it's important to realize that big business cannot do these kind of things unless the governmental structure is there to do it. We don't have to worry about lobbyists unless there's a big government to lobby over. If we had a small constitutional government that was limited to just the functions that are in the Constitution, there wouldn't even be any lobbying business because the politicians couldn't be bought and sold. It all comes back to what P.J. O'Rourke said. When the legislature is going to determine the rules for buying and selling, the first things to be bought and sold will be the legislators. 
because now they can influence the outcome of one's business for good or for ill, and therefore they have to be bought or rented, as it's put. The point is that if we would just simply reduce government to its constitutional limits, then we wouldn't have to worry about big government. We wouldn't have to worry about big labor. We wouldn't have to worry about any of these things because whatever problem somebody might want to cause for us, somebody else would come along and say, I see your problem, and for a small price, I'll be glad to alleviate this problem for you. I'll be glad to sell you this product at a smaller price than that company's asking. I'll be glad to give you a better guarantee, or I'll be glad to give you faster service, or I'll be glad to give you a safer product. Whatever it may be that you're lacking, you can get because industries will compete with each other to try to get your service. But once the government can make the rules, then all you got to do is go to the legislature and outlaw your competition, just like the taxi cabs in Denver and in New York and all the other cities of the country that I mentioned to Don earlier in the broadcast. When we come back, we'll go back to the phones. This is Harry Brown. Stay with us. We still have another half hour to go. Hello again. Harry Brown here. We have three callers waiting on the line right now, and we want to get to all of them, so we won't have time for anyone who calls in now, so I don't advise you to place a call. I want to thank all our callers this evening. We've had some very interesting comments. And Dan, who called earlier, uh, just a few minutes ago, sent me a link to a PBS interview with Osama bin Laden that took place back in May 1998, in which bin Laden, among other things, tells what his grievances are with the United States. And I have put a link to that on the Radio Links page on my website. If you just go to my website, harrybrown.org, and go to the radio page, you'll see links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast, and you can look at it there. Now, I have no more faith in bin Laden than I have in George Bush. I have no more reason to believe that bin Laden is an honest man and that he knows what he's doing and that he's a moral man. But it seems a little strange to me that people are so sure why he hates the United States, that he is pure evil, that he hates us for our freedom, our democracy, or our prosperity, but are unwilling to actually look at his own words and see what he says is the reason that he is carrying on a jihad against the United States. And I think it can be very instructive to look at that interview. Let's talk now with Larry in Sunnyvale, California. Good evening, Larry. Good evening, Harry. What's happening? Well, I want to ask you about a little bit about libertarian persuasion, actually. I saw your email about uh, the upcoming seminar, and I had a, a bit of a failure on my own part of libertarian persuasion a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to ask you for advice. <laughs> okay, well, so, Larry, what's your problem uh, that you wanted some advice on? Well, um, this gentleman uh, felt he had a, a government program that was working really well for him, and he absolutely didn't want to see it dismantled. Um, this was regarding Social Security, mm-hmm. and uh, the other person, I think, was, I mean, they're very intelligent, and they were very logical. Um, I think maybe a little socialist, but, you know, that's okay. Uh, but here was his viewpoint. Uh, he, in particular, his aging mother uh, needs constant care, and he doesn't have the money to pay for it himself, nor does he have, uh, nor does he want her living with him. And uh, he sees Social Security as a 12% tax that uh, pays for his mother's care outright. And he thought, this is a wonderful deal. I'm, I'm getting a wonderful, um, I'm getting a hell of a lot of bang for my buck here. Sure. Uh, so I, I, I said, well, um, but if you hadn't had to pay into Social Security all your life, and your mother hadn't had to pay into Social Security all of her life, she might have had the money to take care of her own uh, self in her retirement. But he wasn't really buying that. So I was wondering, you know, how, where, did I, where, where did I fall down here, or, or what, could I, what else could I have suggested to him to well, sort of seduce him into desiring liberty? Well, there are a number of possible approaches, and uh, the same approach isn't going to work with everyone. For example, with uh, one person, you might say in that circumstance, well, if you're getting such a bargain on this, then somebody else must be making up the difference. Who do you think it is that's making up the difference? Could it be your children or your grandchildren? Could it be people who are having to go without things, who won't be able to live in the house that they would like because they're helping to support your mother? And do you feel good about using using other people's money to take care of your needs. Obviously, you have a real need there, and I think it's important to sympathize with people in circumstances like that. But we all have problems, and the question is, are we going to take care of those problems and look for solutions ourselves, or are we going to ask for other people to pay for them? Now, that may have an effect on some people. It might not have an effect on other people. And what might have an effect on somebody else is, well, it's very easy when we look at these things in isolation to to, to feel that we're really getting a bargain for it. But, you know, As long as we have Social Security, it means we have Medicare. And as long as we have Medicare, it means we have farm subsidies. And as long as we have farm subsidies, we have corporate welfare. And as long as we have corporate welfare, we have foreign aid. And the next thing you know, we have a $2 trillion government. And the result of that is that your children and your grandchildren are paying exorbitant taxes. The tax load on the average American for state, local, and federal taxes of all kinds is about 48%, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. So your children and grandchildren are paying half of their earnings into this system, uh, and you're getting one benefit out of it. If you didn't have this benefit, if we would all just give up these uh, benefits, these little uh, sops that the government gives us, we would all have incomes that would be somewhere close to twice what we have now. Uh, America would be better off. We would have our privacy back. We wouldn't live in fear of the IRS, and everybody we deal with would be better off, and so business would be better, and we'd all be making more money, and your children might even chip in to take care of your grandmother because they would be so much more prosperous than they are now. So the question is, do you want to satisfy your 
yourself at the expense of your children who are starting out in life and are going to have to face this tax load, which is going to get progressively worse as they get older. It doesn't matter whether Bush cuts taxes. We still have a $2 trillion government, and it's going to have to be paid for one way or another. So all he's doing is rearranging the tax code uh, to make it less obvious the way that we're paying for it. So what I'm trying to say here, Larry, is that there are different approaches. I've mentioned before that there are seven things that I can fall back on, and I can never remember at any one time what all the seven are, but I can always remember two or three of them. One of them is to remind people that government is force, and whatever benefit you're getting is at the expense of a fines and imprisonment being imposed upon somebody else or threatened against somebody else. Another is that power will always be abused, and if the politicians have the power to help your mother, then they're going to use that power in some way to their own self-interest, and it's going to attract the worst elements of society who will see that power as a magnet, drawing them uh, to the place where they can do the most for themselves and not for you. Another is that no government program stands still. The fact that we have Social Security is the reason we have this messed up health care system in America today. Without Social Security, we could have never had Medicare. Without Medicare, we wouldn't have this prescription drug program that Bush has now imposed upon us, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, there are four others that that uh, I'll remember the next time I'm faced with this. I, I don't know if this is any help, Larry. But well, that's, uh, first, that's pretty much exactly why I called. Uh, the first, first thing is to remember to sympathize, unless you absolutely do not sympathize. I don't mean for you to be dishonest about it, but people do have problems, and there's nothing wrong with sympathizing with those problems, uh, so that this is not a confrontation. This is an attempt to just explore the situation and see w what the circumstances are and what all the circumstances are, not just those that seem the most obvious. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Larry, and I uh, hope to see you in Atlanta next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you in Sacramento. I'm still looking for that recording online. Uh, yes. Incidentally, that has to do with a drug debate in Sacramento. And just this evening, I sent off another email to the organizers of the debate trying to get my hands on the audio tape so that we can put it on the website. It was a debate with a U.S. attorney over whether the, all the drug laws ought to be repealed. And I guess you can figure out which side I was on. Let's go now to Pittsburgh and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Sorry you've had to wait so long. Oh, that's all right. It's been a good show. And uh, I was going to... Make, I, I'm not sure whether I should talk about the Democrats or talk about uh, more about what you, you were talking about war. Um, a friend of mine was asking me, we were talking about Ayn Rand, so I decided to look up objectivism and online. And I found some Ayn Rand sites, and um, at first it sounded just like libertarianism. They talked about laissez-faire, free market economics, and all that good-sounding stuff. But it didn't. Until they got the foreign policy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There was this guy, you ever heard of Leonard Pico? Oh, Le Le Leonard Peikoff. Sure? Peikoff. Uh, I saw an interview with him online. And, uh, you know, he, it, it's like he sounds like a right winger or something. It's all this, oh, we should be firing nuclear missiles at Iran because that's the source of all terrorism and this, and this is a war of civilizations. And, uh, I oh, mean, yeah. I think, uh, Osama bin Laden wants it to be a war of civilizations. And I think, uh, I mean, it could, it could escalate into one, but I think people like you are trying to warn against that, you know? Yes, and as a matter of fact, uh, what you said that they're saying on these sites, uh, sounds exactly like Osama bin Laden on the other side. It's uh, a holy jihad, and it, it really is difficult to distinguish between the two sides except for one's for America and the other's for Islam. And other than that, they're talking the same language. And I don't see that as being an outgrowth of a belief in a free society and individual liberty and personal responsibility. It is not personal responsibility to have government confiscate our money, uh, draft our citizens, and send them off to war and kill innocent people in the process and pile up numbers of collateral damage. That doesn't sound like individual responsibility or personal liberty to me at all, and yet that is what they get, and uh, I can't explain why it is. I, As a matter of fact, a year or so ago, I contacted a few of those sites and asked to see if they wanted to have somebody come on the show and talk about the war, talk about the war on terrorism, talk about the potential war with Iraq at that time. And I couldn't get a, even an answer from anybody, or it would have been interesting maybe to try to find out where they derived this jihad idea uh, out of the concept of laissez-faire, as you put it. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there might be contradictions in the uh, Rand camp. I mean, I don't mean to try to imply that everybody who, like Ayn Rand, is of the same mind exactly. They're individuals like libertarians or Democrats or anyone else. But the um, uh, when I was listening to an interview with Ayn Rand herself from the 60s, she made a lot of good points about the types of people she called the witch doctors and the types of people she called the Attilas. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in, in our case, an Attila might be George Bush because he's a hawk, and a witch doctor might be Jerry Falwell because he says that Bush's hawkishness is uh, right a good God. example of his Christian faith and all that sure. stuff. So. Um, the thing is, you would think that a person who would recognize that the Attilas and the witch doctors have caused so many problems and so much suffering throughout history would be... On the lookout for them all the time. Right, like, you know, the, well, I mean, and the, the thing about it, though, is that... Uh the, um, Rob, oh, let me interrupt you because we're going to run out of time here in a minute. Uh, Ayn Rand was a brilliant woman, and her books are very, very powerful, and I certainly recommend them to people. You don't have to agree with everything in the book, but you will certainly find your juices stimulated by them well, and, your, and your ideas put to the test. But the point is that she yeah. tended to objectify personal tastes, 
uh, her taste in music and other things. She attempted to prove scientifically that these were the right tastes. Oh my! And, and one Sounds of the like things, and, <laughs> and one of the things that uh, affected her was that she was from Russia. She grew up in the Soviet Union and, fl and fled to the United States, and so she felt very, very strongly about the Cold War. So whatever her beliefs about laissez-faire or anything else, she was a very strong hawk in the Cold War, and I believe that that is probably. Uh, where a lot of the rhetoric that she had about that and how great Reagan was for fighting the Cold War has now uh, transferred itself to Leonard Peikoff and the others who are in the objectivist camp, objectivism being the science that Ayn Rand supposedly founded. And as a result, these people are taking the same attitude uh, with the war on terrorism, the war in the Middle East, and so on. Rob, thanks so much for calling. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. Hello again, and we're in our last segment now, so we're going to move along quickly and talk with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. No problem. I'll get right to the point because I know we're at the end of the line here. Um, I just want to say that psychologically I think it's worth considering that many people have a hard time with the idea that of a libertarian position on uh, foreign policy in general and, and war intervention because um, it requires them to believe that, what are, that people, our highest political leaders, are um, evil or at least guilty of gross negligence. Um, they, they feel uncomfortable when faced with the fact that thousands of people uh, are being killed, innocent people, uh, non-combatants, and they have to. They feel like they have to believe it's for some good reason that sure. this is happening. Sure, I and understand that. It's very also very difficult for people who are veterans of wars that are unjustifiable to believe that they were there for no good reason. Sure, um, of course, and this, uh, people have an emotional interest in protecting the status quo, but it's also interesting that people generally consider politicians to be liars by nature. Politicians rank uh, alongside used car dealers in the public's estimation of credibility, and that's sort of a general observation, but when it comes to the specifics, they're willing to believe specifically that the politician is telling the truth in this case, and especially when it has to do with national defense, and part of the reason for that is because they never confront national defense directly. They go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and see what a mess it is there. They deal with a post office and have to fight to try to get some semblance of order there, uh, and so they know that these things don't work correctly, but they assume, not ever having confronted the Department of Defense in person, Person, that it must be uh, an organization that knows what it's doing and that is very efficient. They don't realize that the Department of Defense is just simply the post office in fatigues. Absolutely. And uh, if I'll, I'll just we'll end with this one last thing. Um, on Neil Borch's website, the radio host is scheduled to speak at the Libertarian Convention. Yes. Uh, it says he has a, a, a section called Neil's News, and in his section on Neil's News, he writes, I get this quote-unquote Bush lie nonsense almost daily on the show. Uh, I always ask the caller to cite just one lie told by Bush. They can't. They nip him up for a while and then go away. Uh, I think maybe uh, you ought to send him that lying for a living article that you had because if he honestly doesn't, uh, yeah, uh, doesn't have any idea about what Bush, uh, that Bush lied at all, then... Right. Uh, even, even if he doesn't believe their lies, he knows what the allegations are. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And let's wind up with one email. I wish I could have gotten the time to cover some of the other emails we've gotten. They've been very interesting. Bob says, I'm a little depressed about the current state of affairs in the world. Cheer me up. I like what you're doing, but give me some hope. Well, let me say this, Bob. We could not have this kind of a foreign policy without big government. We had problems in the 19th century, but it was the introduction of the income tax and the Federal Reserve System that made it possible for America to get into World War I. America never could have gotten into World War I and caused the problems that it did if it hadn't been for the income tax because it increased the federal budget over 18 times over, and that was possible only with an income tax. You can't raise tariffs and excise taxes on that magnitude because people will just quit buying the products that are being taxed and the revenues will fall. So the point is that if we work towards reducing government in general, to getting government down to its constitutional limits, we will indirectly change foreign policy out of necessity. They will have to pull in their horns, stop supporting foreign dictators, stop meddling in other countries. And that's easier to do than it might seem. Just remember the great libertarian offer when somebody tells you about some great government program. Would you give up your favorite federal programs if it meant you never have to pay income tax again and your children will never have to pay income tax and your grandchildren will never have to pay income tax? Isn't it worth it to give up some piddly little subsidy you're getting to free your children and grandchildren forever? I think so. And with that, we do have a chance. It's a long shot, but we do have a chance. This is Harry Brown. I hope you come back next week. I really enjoy talking with you on Saturday nights. Have a good week. Good night. <laughs>